Hello and welcome to Russians with Attitude. Today's special guest is an American journalist, Jackson Hinkle. Hey, Jack. How's it going? And our traditional question is, uh, what are you guys drinking? I'm drinking some cheapo energy drink from a plastic <laughs> bottle that's probably going <laughs> to give me xenoestrogens and mellow out my political views. And what about you? Uh, I'm rocking. I just got a morning coffee and an ice Americano and uh, rocking a Zin in, in the upper deck. You, you guys don't got Zins in Russia, do you? You know what those are? Zins? Do you mean zinc? Zinc? <laughs> like no, a vitamin? No. When I was in Russia, that was one of the things I was like bummed about. The, they're like <laughs> little nicotine pouches. And I mm. think in Russia, they banned them. No, no, no. We have uh, nicotine pouches for sure. They're called uh, snooze, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, it's but like snooze is tobacco and, and zins are like not with tobacco. It's just yeah. like nicotine salt or something. Ah, ah yeah. I see. Well, there is Sorry, Central Asian yeah. Naswai, uh, kind of uh, <laughs> tobacco mix with chicken shit, and they always have it uh, under their lips. <laughs> All right. But enough about that. Uh, Kirill, are you also drinking coffee? Yes, I just made myself a cup of coffee. Okay. So allow me to introduce us to you. I am Nikolai. So we are two Russian guys, two lazy internet journalists or amateur historians. Our channel is kind of an English-speaking hub of everything that concerns Russia, however slightly it might be. And uh, our main difference with RT and Sputnik uh, is that, well, we are far less productive, probably funnier, <laughs> and we are not funded by any states or any big sponsors, uh, as we are completely crowdfunded and depend on $5 donations on Patreon and Gumroad. But enough about us. So, Jackson, can you briefly introduce yourself and tell the audience what you are all about? Yeah, so I, uh, of course, I've been following you guys for a while, and uh, especially through the war in Ukraine. Uh, I, I used to be a YouTuber. I don't know what I call myself anymore, just like a political commentator, I guess. But I'm 24 years old, and when I was about like, like. 1920 i started following a lot of political commentators on youtube like jimmy Dore, for example american i'm american so i followed a lot of like american political commentators kyle kalinsky and i thought that i wanted to do that so i started my own show but i, I was always just very interested in foreign policy so you know when i was starting i covered a lot of stuff regarding u.s foreign policy with venezuela uh, syria because those were really hot button issues during the Trump administration. And he was very in Iran, of course. Um, and then, you know, coming out of that, the the Biden administration, I knew it was just going to be an absolute mess. And um, that's what we got from Afghanistan to Ukraine to everything they're trying to do to China to now what's going on in Gaza. I've, I've just been following that. And I do cover domestic politics, but um, I'd say I'm mostly focused on foreign policy. And uh, other than that, yeah, I live in Miami and just an average guy like working out, like going out, enjoying the town. And uh, that's about it. Yeah. What's the weather like in Miami right now? It is colder than usual. It's it's not as bad as Moscow, but you know, it's like it's like 60 high 60s, so it's just like a little bit cloudy out, kind of windy and cold, but usually the weather here is absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. It's funny, but you Jackson are the first guest of our show who is younger than us. Uh, but I would never tell that you are just 24, judging by uh, your picture. You look uh, a bit older. So have you uh, ever been told that you look like a 35-year-old man? <laughs> or is it part of this whole preppy political wonk vibe? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I've definitely been told that. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's something in the water out here. But you know what I always think, too? It's like, you brought up that comment earlier about uh, the soyification of like uh, our, our generation and stuff, drinking out of plastic water bottles and stuff. And it's like, you look at older generations, you look at, you know, our grandparents who fought in World War II, you see photos of them and they, they look kind of like me when they're about my age. But now we have these like 22, 24 year old kids that look like they could still be in high school. It's very odd. 
Yeah, it's true about the Soviet Union men as well. Well, I guess I'm the victim of the plastic bottles because <laughs> I look <laughs> a bit younger than my age. Uh, I get asked for a passport when I uh, buy seats. You really? Really? Uh, well, sometimes. <laughs> not, not always, but sometimes. Yeah, uh, but all right. So uh, we will not talk too much about the news or ideologies. So it, it will be kind of an up personal interview, perhaps, that will help our listeners understand who you really are. Because judging by your Twitter page, well, it's unclear. <laughs> and uh, so th there are many claims that you are this and that, a provocateur and, of course, a Putler's agent, as I'm sure most Americans uh, think that we are as well. So it's time, I guess, to clear things out in uh, uh, honest conversation. And let's start with some earlier pages of your biography. Uh, Wikipedia states that you were big into environmentalist movement back in 2017 or maybe before that. So two questions. What motivated you to be part of this movement? And have you ever read Unda Bomber's manifesto? No, I haven't read that. But what I'll say is, you know, grow, I grew up in California, which is a very, you know, it's a very liberal state, but I grew up in a I grew up in like a very conservative area of California and growing up, I didn't have any politics in my life and my family's not political at all. My town is just a very, that I grew up in is just a very normal, small town America. I started to become a very, uh, you know, like active surfer when I was in, when I was in like middle school or elementary school, I was probably about 11 or 12 when I was just surfing all the time, I saw that we had like a nuclear power plant that was being decommissioned and they were pumping out this, uh, you know, like the radioactive water in the ocean that you couldn't surf on certain days because of it. And then there was always trash in the ocean. So I guess it kind of came from a more material grounding is not, not sort of any uh, ideological lean uh, that I cared about environmental issues. Then as I started to get a little bit older, getting through high school, that's when the ideological aspect of it came into play. And I started to uh, kind of become indoctrinated with a more liberal uh, globalist mindset when it came to environmental issues and it became more political. But it started off as just, you know, caring about what I was doing and where I was living and seeing that it was kind of gross. And even still, it was a very nice town. Like if I lived in downtown Los Angeles growing up, I mean, that would have been disgusting because that, that city is just filled with trash. But yeah, it just came from that and um, kind of went on from there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really confusing, actually, how an all-American Californian young man even became interested in the foreign policy later on at all, uh, because, well, Americans didn't used to care about things that happen in other continents. It was unheard of. But now things are changing, starting with the Ukrainian conflict and now Palestine. So do you think that uh, Americans started caring more about foreign policy? For me, you know, like I said, it was uh, looking at when I started my show, it was really looking at the Trump administration. And I, I guess my my concern for any political issue uh, that I talk about, usually on my show or on Twitter, it comes out of a sincere uh, effort, I guess, to expose what I, what I think are obvious lies. And the biggest lies of all are the lies that are used to justify war. And... When you couple those lies and how much money they're sending abroad to whatever war or whatever venture uh, or even sanctioning countries, I mean, doing that to, to countries all across the world and starving people and destroying economies, it's like, how, how is it that the American public doesn't you know, see this and is in, in a lot of cases actually signing off and supporting these foreign ventures when our country is crumbling? So- I think that's why for me, I care about it so much because I don't want to have anything to do with any country on the face of the earth. Like I think the United States should 
of course, pursue trade and good relations with other countries, but we shouldn't be doing what we're doing right now, especially when our country's falling apart. And I think if you can effectively highlight that, you can show the American public that you know our government doesn't work for us. And from that point, then take them to a position of like, okay, let's all stop these wars and let's focus on our own needs. So that's really why I care about it. I see. You mentioned that you started your political activism back in high school. And uh, I have noticed that there is a, a whole race of American high schoolers who go to debate classes or start dressing up in preppy costumes. And by the time they're 20, they establish a whole political commentator career for themselves. They pick a political cause or position that is convenient for their eventual donors or not convenient for anyone to be edgy to garner attention. For example, Ben Shapiro or Nick Fuentes, I think they're very similar in this background. Uh, so were you by any chance a debate kid in school? I was not, but I think if I had a debate club at my school, I probably would have fit the mold for it. Um, I think that it's probably best that young kids live their lives rather than comment on complex matters, especially related to foreign policy. And, you know, I, I'm someone who does that. So I guess I'm a hypocrite, but I just spend so much time, uh, you know, learning about the history. And I think that's where everyone should start is learning about the history about the world. because there's just so much you could spend your whole life learning history and, and, about one subject or one country, and then that would be it. But I think the other factor there is it's it, in some ways it's kind of good when young people talk about politics because you know Tucker Carlson is someone who started to you know he he started his career very early on and he got some pretty big issues very wrong, like the Iraq war, for example. He supported the Iraq war for a little bit of time, and he's since apologized for supporting it. And I think, you know, it's good for people to have those mistakes, learn early on, I guess, that uh, they made mistakes. But unfortunately, like you mentioned, there's a lot more people who will not admit when they're wrong, and they will go on uh, to just pursue a career rather than tell the truth, they'll continue to say whatever BS that they're talking about uh, to get those donors for the Daily Wire or whatever it may be. And, and that's that's the most dangerous thing of all when you treat it more like a, a career where you need to have investors and you need to have uh, at, like powerful allies and stuff. Like I really don't have any friends in politics. I, I've only got a few. You know, I, I think that that's how you should look at it. Mm hmm. Who are your friends in politics? Haas of the Infrared Show is is one of them. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's um, he's someone who's introduced Dugan to me, and and mm. he's just been my closest ally uh, throughout the past several years. And we connected initially after I debated a popular liberal YouTuber named Vosh about the OPCW cover up in uh, Duma, Syria. You know, I, Jimmy Dore is another one. He's a close friend of mine. But really beyond that, those are the only two guys I trust, Haas and Jimmy Dore. That, that, I, other than that, I, I, you know, I have allies, I guess, but I, I don't trust anyone. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, Jimmy Dore is a former liberal or a liberal socialist, I'm not sure, who kind of divorced himself uh, from the Young Turks and uh, started his own thing. And he's also this kind of weird ideological mix of well, left and right, you know. But uh, for now, enough about America, your Russian podcast. Uh, please share your first impression of Russia. Uh, what was it? Be honest. If, even if it is a Gopnik meme from 10 years ago or <laughs> Rambo movie. Well, my first impression was Moscow. And it was that I definitely need to come back here as many times as possible in my life because I loved it so much. And I I didn't think I was going to – I thought I was going to like it, but I didn't think I was going to like love it the way I did. Yeah. Um, and I haven't been to a ton of places outside of the United States, but I've been to, you know, I've been to a handful. And it was – 
as far as like um as far as a city goes as far as uh you know not a vacation travel destination like bali for example but like an actual city it was my favorite place i've ever been i mean it was so clean uh the streets were you know not filled with homeless people the architecture was incredible the nightlife was amazing the food was really the best i've ever had uh the people were were funny and nice and i just loved it uh St. Peter's St. Petersburg I didn't like as much but I I still liked it a lot. Uh but I feel like it was a bit more um Dark. like less investment was put into yeah, it sure. has been put into St. Petersburg recently. Uh but I I really loved Moscow and Russia was great. Mhm. Mm and there are more hobos uh, in Peter as well. Yeah. <laughs> Actually uh the Uh, some even call all Peter citizens um, uh, hobos. It, it's a <laughs> nickname for <laughs> Peter dwellers. But yeah, you like Moscow. It's interesting when I think there is a factor that people uh, are so amazed by Moscow because they don't know what to expect. Because uh, you have high expectations for like Paris. Paris. What is it in English? Paris. Paris. Paris, 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 Paris. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like uh, you know, uh, but uh, when you actually go there, it's full of jurors and homeless people, and you are kind of under yeah. disappointed. And uh, with Moscow, what were like your childhood Im image of Moscow like? Um, I guess my childhood image of Moscow, I, really, as an American, you don't think about Russia that much. Um, as a young person at all really but i think the only the only images i've ever had painted for me about russia were i think there's a disney film about uh anya the princess the, who, yeah anastasia uh, anastasia yeah yeah anastasia the the she's like the long lost daughter of the the czar's family during the revolution and That kind of painted a very beautiful picture of Russia, uh, like one that's um, obviously fantastical, like a fantasy. But um, honestly, it lived up to that. It, it was it was quite special. Everything was just I when when people when Americans asked me what I thought about it, the only word I could really use to describe Russia was, I, and I mean the the major cities. We went through some of the more or less populated uh regions but as far as the major cities go it was very fancy and in like a real fancy like what paris probably used to be uh years and years and years ago and i just fell in love with it the only thing i'll say is uh the young people in russia it was kind of odd because there was a lot of young people who were very patriotic and kind of fit mm -hmm. the mold of what i would define as a fancy and educated class Uh, even if they themselves were not wealthy in any way, shape, or form. But, you know, they dressed nice. They were respectful. And then we went out to, we went out to like a club. And mm -hmm. that was very odd because everyone was just trying to, it felt like everyone was trying to act like they lived in Los Angeles or something. Mm -hmm. And the way they talked, the way they acted, it felt very fake. That was a little bit weird. There's a little bit of Western influence in some of the younger generation. Well, for sure. Uh, but clubs, well, normal people really don't go to clubs nowadays, right? It's a very weird place to go to. But uh, what didn't you like about Moscow? Maybe low level of English proficiency or maybe not enough high rises. What was it? <laughs> well, the one funny thing was whenever I'd order an iced Americano, which is my favorite coffee drink, just like basically, you know, I iced uh, with wa ice with water and an espresso shot. No one knew what I was talking about, mm -hmm. and they don't serve that there. So they would they be, just mix it, I, right? Yeah, or they they don't. You guys don't do iced drinks a whole lot. You and it's not just yeah. Russia. When I was in Turkey, it was the same thing. They always want to serve hot drinks. So you guys don't have a lot of ice drinks from what I saw. Maybe it's because it's so cold there already. But um, 
it, that that was interesting. There really, there was, I mean, yeah, low English proficiency, of course, but I, you know, you get by just Google Translate. It's very easy to get around. And I don't know, there, there wasn't a whole lot that I disliked about Moscow, I guess. It was, a, it was a great place to visit. The weather towards the end was not ideal. It was getting starting to get cold. And I heard that Russia's had very heavy snow this winter. So maybe that's yeah. part of that. But um, no, I mean, I, I, I loved it. Have you tried a rough coffee? Have I tried what? A rough coffee. Rough coffee. Half coffee? Rough, rough. rough. Like rough. It's, uh, it's, I think, pretty much the only coffee drink that was actually invented in Russia. It's not... Uh, oh, is it? Russia is not really a coffee country. Um, well, so, yeah. Tea, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it used to be. Like, 20 yeah, years ago, I mean, there were no coffee it's... places at all. Uh, that was uh, the authentic Russia. Now, yeah, <laughs> as you say, there is a lot of Western influence and good or, and bad one. Probably it's good to have uh, coffee and good coffee at that. But <laughs> actually, very good trait that we don't have um, high English proficiency. But I'm not sure. Do you think that high English proficiency always translates to... Uh, well, Los Angelification of the people, or it's possible to avoid. <laughs> I think that um, I think that you know Russian culture should be celebrated, and I think that you know, of course, you know, there's. I think America has a lot more to learn about Russia than Russia has to learn from America. And I don't think that low English proficiency is necessarily a problem, especially the way that the world is headed. It seems like more and more people are probably learning Russian in developing countries than English at this point. Uh, but probably not. But yeah. <laughs> well, in a in Africa, for example, it's pretty. I from what I see, it's just Russia is well, popping yeah. off all over the place. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I don't think it's a problem. Uh, it's only a problem if you're an American traveling there and you want to talk to some of the Russian beauties in Moscow because it's that that was one other thing. The the level of absolutely stunning women everywhere in Russia, just mainly in Moscow. St. Petersburg was kind of like dark and goth, but in Moscow, it, it was insane. There was just there was hot women on every street corner. It was crazy. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. Well, thinner too. There is a huge boom and trend on being extremely thin. Well, it's not only in Russia, but I think uh, Moscow especially because it's um, traversable by foot and the metro station. So you don't really need to own a car in Moscow. And that burns some calories. As to the classical Russian culture. Have you read Dostoevsky or Tolstoy? I haven't, but I've, you know, I, I've, it's been recommended to me. I haven't, I, I like to read a lot of biographies and history related books that are, I guess, um, not stories as much, but I, I've never read Dostoevsky or, or Tolstoy, but I intend to do so at some point. Um, but there's honestly, it's not just Russian like literature. That's so incredible. I mean, you could go to, we went to the opera, we went to the ballet there. The, I mean, it's just, it's, it's endless. Uh, I've seen a good chunk of Russian cinema. We went to the place where they filmed, I think it's called, uh, it's something to do with like a streetcar or railway or something like that. I saw the movie for free on YouTube, but we went to the place where they filmed that movie. It was pretty cool. There's just so much to be proud of in Russian culture. And I feel like in America, we really only know the main authors and that's it. We only know the literature, but there's so much and there's so much that is even celebrated in American culture that we don't know is, is Russian. We just kind of have adopted it. Like last night, I went and saw the Nutcracker at the Miami City Ballet in a few months, they're going to be doing Swan Lake. And I, I think most Americans don't probably don't even know that these are of Russian origin. Yeah. Well, and the Hollywood as well was guided by Stanislavski's method, etc. But um, as to your posting career, so uh, prior to October 2023, 
you were commenting on Russian Ukrainian war and uh, the moment when Hamas made uh, its first move uh, with paragliders, rave concerts, etc. You have completely switched your attention to Palestine. And that move made you more famous uh, on Twitter. You quadrupled your audience or something. Personally, it made your timeline unreadable to me because it's like Palestinian doctor Al-Hamidi was killed by uh, the Zionist pigs. And I go like, oh, sorry, that happened. And that's why I don't comment on the conflict too much because... Well, uh, frankly, it's of no interest to me. But what is it to you, a personal vendetta or a job opportunity? Um, well, for me, like I've I've actually followed the plight of Palestinians longer than I've been aware of, you know, the issues in the Donbass, and mm. um, so I, I've followed it for for years, really, since I started my show. Because that that's an issue that is, um, I guess, closer to America because of the influence of Zionists in American culture uh, and politics, and also just how much we how much money we send to Israel every year. So that's something more Americans are familiar with. And for me, um, you know, it, it's I, I see it as one in the same. It's like. Okay, the U.S. is sending money, doing trainings with Ukrainian special forces, cooing the Ukrainian government to kill innocent civilians in the Donbass. That's bad. You know, 15,000 killed over eight years. That's bad. Um, or, or the U.S. sending billions to Israel to kill 15,000 people in two months. That is also bad. So uh, that th this, this is a, it's a very big issue because I think, of course, with... Uh, you know, there, like in, in Alexander Dugan's, I believe it's mo his most recent book, it's The Great Awakening versus The Great Reset. He talks about how, you know, there is this great awakening that's taking place, not just with the MAGA movement in the US, not just with the anti-EU sentiments in Europe, um, not just with the project of the Communist Party of China, but also, of course, with, with Russia and the way in which Putin has kind of just marched on in and he looks like he's the only one with balls on the global stage right now doing what he's doing, standing up to the West. But now we have a, a second domino that has fallen in this great awakening. And I, I do believe that's the great awakening that's now taking place, a, a subsect of it that's now taking place in the Middle East. And I, I think it would be surprising if this rages on for too much longer and we don't start to see some other dominoes falling like um, Yemen, for example, getting involved or Hezbollah getting involved. So I, I just think it's another uh, part of this whole great awakening. And you know, I don't talk about Russia as much anymore because the, the writing was on the wall from the first several months. I mean, everyone knew how that was going to end it, really from the first day. You know, I was asked, how is this going to, I was on, I was on Jimmy Dore's show and it was like the first week of the SMO. And he said, how do you think this is going to end? And I said, I think it's going to end however Putin wants it to end. So at a certain time, it just kind of becomes repetitive talking about it. It's like yeah. Russia took another city. Russia did this. Russia. It's like, okay, we know how this is going to end. The, history is determined with regard to this matter. Their fate is sealed. Um, what is going to happen next? And the next big thing is the Middle East. And we'll see where it goes next. Maybe Taiwan, maybe Africa eventually, who knows? But this is the next big domino that's falling. Well, I'm not sure that the fate is sealed. And this is where the free segment of our podcast ends. Just admit it, you are hooked and you need to learn more to flex your newly acquired esoteric knowledge on a random art hall that you have a crush on. Free yourself from tedious American monoculture and subscribe to Russians with Attitude to get full access to weekly episodes from the forbidden part of the world. Thank you.